Listed buildings, are they a good thing? Should even something like this be listed? There are people who want to demolish this famous car park in Gateshead. There are others who want to have it listed and preserved for as long as possible. Which of these groups is right, hmm? That's today's question. But maybe don't try to answer it just yet. Not until you've had a chance to look at a building which is truly repulsive. Ugh. Here's a description of this architectural monstrosity. It appears only a heavy, lumpish, unrefined mass of materials jumbled together without design, regularity or order. Mm. It sounds ghastly, doesn't it? It's too long and too high for its breadth. The windows are performed without rule, without beauty or design. Mm. That was the 18th century critic Robert Morris talking about well, actually, he was talking about Westminster Abbey, but he meant any big medieval Gothic building, and he would have said exactly the same about Ripon. One of his contemporaries, another architectural critic called Stephen Rio, wrote in 1760, Gothic arches are so barbarous an aspect that it is sufficient to condemn them on that account alone. This arch is made up of two curves intersecting against each other with a harshness as grating as the most repugnant lines in nature. Ooh, strong stuff. Well, I don't suppose that many of us would agree with that nowadays. We tend to like our cathedrals, nice and gothic, and a facade like this west front at Ripon seems to us not barbarous, but ethereal, spiritual, perfect. The point I'm making is that tastes change. Things fall out of favour and get replaced with new ideas. In the distant past, nobody ever seems to have questioned the changes in style very much. Take the cathedral here. That west front is a perfect example of the early English style, put up round about the year 1220. But if we walk around the corner, the building reveals a much more complicated history. Here's the same early English stuff, but then we move on to something completely different. Big fancy buttresses and huge windows, this time in what's known as the Perpendicular Gothic style. This whole middle section of the church was rebuilt round about 1500, but they didn't bother to knock down the early English stuff and they didn't bother with this either. This isn't even Gothic. This is much older still. It's even older than the West Front. It's in the Norman style. It's got a fabulous Norman style doorway around the corner here. But look at the windows up above there. Round arched Norman windows. They've been tarted up, given a bit of tracery and made sort of Gothic-ish by some later builder. You see, nobody cared. Nobody worried that they were mucking about with what was there before. And the effect is, well, what is the effect? It's a gorgeous mixture, in my opinion. Certainly not a heavy, lumpish, unrefined mass of materials, as the 18th century critic thought. You can't imagine anybody ever wanting to spoil or demolish something as beautiful as this. But the downside of making changes like these is that you have to destroy what was there before. This section might have been even more beautiful before they put those big windows in. It's a balance, it's a worry. What to get rid of and what to keep. And sometimes the balance gets upset.
It certainly got upset in Victorian times. Now here we are down by the quayside in Newcastle, which was the medieval heart of the town. This was one of the richest towns in England, and it was awash with splendid merchants' houses. But where are they now, eh? That's what you'll all be asking back at home. Well, not all of them disappeared. These are still medievalish buildings, but uh, so there are a few of them, but not that many, because most, most got washed away in the tide of progress, because towns were changing. The world was changing, and the Northeast was at least partly responsible. The Northeast gave the world railways, and look what they did for us in return, sliced through the middle of our towns. No one's going to complain about that, of course, because it looks fantastic. It's one of the most dramatic things in any city anywhere. But it must have come as a shock to people who are used to little three-storied, half-timbered or brick houses to have something as monumental as that zooming over their heads. And what on earth they thought when people started to knock down their mighty and ancient castle in order to build a railway line right through the middle of it. It was things like this that first made the alarm bells begin to ring and made people begin to wonder whether change ought to be controlled. In particular, a proposal to build a railway right through the middle of Stonehenge caused the first national outcry. The first organisation to try to do something about it was a group called the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. But to discuss them, I'm afraid I'm going to have to struggle out into the heart of the English countryside. Oh, sigh. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> this is the church of St Bartholomew at Whittingham, near Annick in Northumberland. It's a really ancient church. In fact, the tower here is Anglo-Saxon. That makes it 13 or 1400 years old. But other bits of the church are really old too. If you look up here, you can see where the really old stonework has been added to by later builders. But inside, it's jolly nice, as we architectural historians say. Well now, what have we got here? Well, obviously we've got Anglo-Saxon stuff up around the tower, and this is the South Arcade. This dates from the late 13th or the early 14th century, and it's got a number of features which make that clear. Big pointed arches with double chamfer to it, and this triangular bit here is called a brooch, and that's all typical of the 13th and 14th century, and so are these octagonal piers. So that's a genuine medieval arcade. This one over here on the north side, which looks just the same, isn't. Until 1845, there was a much older arcade here with round Norman arches and round piers. The vicar, the reverend, good enough, rather ironically, since he thought it wasn't good enough, and the architect, who's quite a famous architect called John Green, who built the Theatre Royal in Newcastle, for example, they were offended that these two arcades weren't neat and tidy and matching, so they decided to pull one of them down and replace it with this. Apparently, they did exactly the same thing with the tower. They had it stuffed with gunpowder, ready to blow it up, when the villagers stepped in and made them stop. This is still a beautiful church, but what happened here is absolutely typical of what was happening to Victorian churches all over the country. They were being tidied up wholesale, restored to death. Come outside again for a moment. 
You see, apart from the really old stonework of the tower, a lot of the stonework of the church doesn't really look that old. It's been cleaned up, scraped smooth. And that brings me back to the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. It was founded by William Morris in 1877 because he was shocked by the excessive restoration that he saw taking place all over the country. In fact, the society had the nickname Anti-Scrape because its members hated the way that rough old walls were being scraped, bland and smooth so that all the signs of ancientness were being taken away. They started the movement in England for the preservation of old buildings, which was to lead eventually to some of the happiest days of my life. Not to mention the unpleasantness of the bull in the field and the horror of the flying dog. And of course, to the movement to list the Gateshead car park. One day, in the spring of 1984, I drove out into the Northumbrian countryside to start my life as a lister of buildings of architectural and historic interest. It was very exciting, because for the first time in my life, I had a mileage allowance, 35p a mile. I drove along going 35, 70, one pound and five pence. Very, very exciting. And I had lots of things with me in the car, of course. A flask, needless to say, and sandwiches, many sandwiches, because that's my Indian name, John Many Sandwiches Grundy. A pie or two, and probably a chocky bicky. So I'd set off for somewhere like Whittingham, whose church we were looking at earlier. And my clipboard, of course, because I was a government official and no government official likes to be seen in public without a clipboard. And I had a pad of forms like these, HB30s, upon which to record the details of any buildings which I thought might be worth listing. And I had maps, six inch to the mile maps for any district that I was visiting. My work was divided up into parishes and I had to visit every man-made structure on this map and decide whether it was worth listing. It was a fantastic job. I'd just come to somewhere gorgeous like this and start looking. The basic principle is that the more recent a building is, the better it's got to be. It's either got to be in really good and original nick, or it's got to be important for some reason. So cottages like these, however attractive they might be, wouldn't get listed, partly because they're not that old. They date from the middle of the 19th century. But on top of that, they've been altered. They've been given new doors and windows and things. This, on the other hand, definitely gets listed. Anything that dates from before 1500 gets listed, whatever condition it's in. And this is really old. 14th century tower, definitely listable. Mind, I'm really pleased to see that somebody's finally doing something about this building. This is more marginal. I would probably list this. Well, actually, let's be honest, I did list this. It's not very old either. It was built as the police station in 1859, but it's hardly been altered at all. And 1859 is fairly early for a rural police station. So this has got historical value as well as architectural. So that gets listed just. See what a fantastic job it was. Mind there were some downsides. I got bitten twice, and that was by the humans. I 
I was taught by my boss, who was called Dolly, the best way to deal with difficult dogs. She said that you should use a clipboard and put it in front of their teeth and follow them around so that they couldn't bite you. I never dared do it myself, though. I'm afraid I ran away from a lot of cows, two Charolais bulls, one homicidal horse tried to nuzzle me to death, and on one memorable occasion, I was savaged by a flock of terrifying geese. I got threatened with a shotgun once by a man who thought it would be better if I didn't list his buildings, and on the whole, I tended to agree with him. This business of protecting old buildings started, as I was saying before, in 1877, but it was slow to get going. Some of the really major buildings, cathedrals and so on, were given a bit of government protection in 1913, but it was very limited. Listing didn't start until after the Second World War. Actually, during the war, councils were looking for advice as to what to do about bomb-damaged buildings, whether to shore them up or to demolish them. So the 1944 Planning Act set up the listed buildings process to tell councils what was important and what wasn't. There are three categories of listed buildings. The very best are listed Grade 1. The church here at Whittingham is listed Grade 1 because of its Saxon stuff. That tower that we were looking at before that was being restored, that's listed two-star because it's really old and it's in pretty good nick. About 10% of the listed buildings in the country are either one or two-star, and they have access to government grants. All of the rest are grade two. Listing a building isn't the same as putting a preservation order on it. Because it's listed doesn't mean it can't be changed. The point is just to tell the planning officer what they've got, so that they can make informed decisions about them. So that was listing Grundy style. Quietly recording, gentle, rural, pretty, nice old buildings. But the reason I was doing it was just a touch more gutsy and contentious. <laughs> Which brings me back to the Gateshead car park, more or less. Apparently, in the early 1980s, Michael Heseltine, the Minister for the Environment, got really cross when a 1930s factory he admired, I think it was the Dunlop factory, was knocked down before he could do anything to save it. So he insisted, there and then, that the listing process, which had been drifting on half-heartedly for decades, be done now, right away. Knee messing. I think that's the way that Mr. Heseltine put it. And it was. Astonishingly for this country, it was done in no time at all. So by 1987, the process was over. Sort of. You see, there were hardly any modern buildings on the list. And so since 1987, the date at which a building can get listed has gradually sneaked later and later. 30s buildings, 60s buildings, Anything over 25 years old is eligible nowadays. This car park is definitely listable, if it's good enough. So is this a good thing? It is not. I put it to you that it's impossible to judge a building in so short a time. A building needs to stand the test of time before we can be certain of its quality. Not so. The problem is that nearly all buildings go out of fashion for a while after they've been built, and far too many of them get lost before they have a chance to prove themselves. They need protecting. Bad buildings shouldn't be protected. Far too many bad buildings have been put up in the last 50 years. Consider the 1960s. Virtually all of the buildings put up at that time were large, brutal and insensitive, this one is undoubtedly large, brutal, and insensitive. Knock it down! Save it! Knock it down! Save it! The 
debate's been raging for 30 years now. To pull it down because it's so big and intrusive, or to keep it because it's an almost perfect example of a particular time. A time that just happens to be unpopular at the moment. I have to tell you that I thought it was marvellous when it first went up. I thought it was bold and innovative. I thought it was startlingly sculptural in its shape. I thought the restaurant on the roof with the big oval windows and the untreated concrete walls was the coolest thing imaginable. To be honest, I still think all of that, and as an old buildings lister, I think that we should always try to preserve the best examples of the past. But on the other hand, it is big, and it has had 40 years to prove its worth, and people still seem to hate it. So, to list or to crush beneath the great boot of history, that is the question. I wish I knew the answer.